Hey, we're so glad that you're here. I also want to just welcome those that are watching us at home. Listen, if you're at home for health reasons, stay home, be healthy. If you're at home out of habit, come out and join us. We got, a, we got some extra chairs. We'll find some more. We just welcome you, and we're glad that you're with us today. So next week is Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. Come on, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are starting a brand new series on that day. It's a series called Her. And for the next several weeks after that, we're going to be looking at women, godly women, of great influence in Scripture. So get ready. It's going to be really good. The first one out of the, out of the gate is Mary Magdalene. And I can't wait to just talk about her life and what an incredible influence. Out of all the people in the world... Jesus chose her to reveal himself after he was resurrected. It's incredible. Now, the last couple weeks, we've been in this little mini-series called Raising the Dead. And it's kind of a provocative title, and let me explain it for those of you who are here for the first time or coming in in the middle of the movie. We're talking about raising the dead and really talking about our hearts and our lives. And we, last week, we talked about raising our awareness of the lost, And the predicament that they are in, being apart from Christ, being under the judgment of God, John says, until that judgment is lifted off through forgiveness. And so we thought about that and we talked about that. And today we're going to discuss how that predicament that they are in kind of coincides and intersects with our position in Christ. Now I'm going to be speaking mostly to believers here today, those that profess Christ, but if you're in a place in your journey, you're not there yet, we welcome you, we're glad you're here, we're glad that you're watching, we're just asking you to listen in, I think you're going to get something really good out of this message as well, but again, today is mainly to Christians because this is about igniting and reviving our hearts to remember those who are outside the body of Christ today. And we want to be moving forward in that. And here's the first thing that we need to do. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he tells us this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. You know, Jesus was the forerunner. He went before us. He gave his body. It was broken so that we could experience forgiveness But God is asking us not to sacrifice ourselves unto death, but to make a different kind of sacrifice. He says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. And I love this. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, come on. I love getting together with the family of God and worshiping corporately together because it just reinforces the presence, the power, and the values of the kingdom that we hold so dearly. But that's not all that worship is, folks. Every morning when you get up, you can present yourself to God, a living sacrifice for that day. And when you and I do that, that's a beautiful aroma of worship to God. He receives that, and He receives you and I in doing that. So we follow Christ as our example in those things. We walk after him, and we find the joy that he found in serving others. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He had his eyes fixed on a bigger prize, the prize of being pleasing to the Father and opening the gates of heaven for all that would enter in. And Paul tells us that when we offer ourselves as that sacrifice, What it does is it answers a wonderful question for us. It's the question we all want to know. God, what's your will for my life? What do you want me to do in this world? And so Paul answers that in verse 2. He says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. So he's saying you've got to be different. You and I have to look different, sound different. But let God transform you, and this is from the inside out, transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. He's telling you it starts up here. 
It starts with our perceptions. And when we do that, this is the byproduct, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, we've got it all backwards. We want to just, hey, God, tell me what your will is for me, and then I'll go do it. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, present your body as a living sacrifice first and foremost unto God. And then once you do that, the will of God is going to unfold in your life. You're going to find yourself walking in the will and in the purpose of God. Listen, Paul didn't think through to the end conclusion of what it was going to be like, the explosiveness of the church when he set out. Just out of, out of reverence for God and obedience, he just went out on his first missionary journey, and as he went, God unfolded the will. And he found himself writing two-thirds of the New Testament. He found himself suffering for Christ. He found himself encouraging believers all over the world. And we know from his writings, his goal was to go to the ends of the earth, which was Spain at that time. Spain was considered the end, as far as you could go. And that's what he was pushing towards. And so when we put God first, then his will becomes manifest in our lives. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I want you to write some things down. You should have paper notes in your welcome guide. And uh, if you've got the app, we encourage you. We've got all the notes on there. You can just fill them in on your phone, your tablet, your iPad, whatever you have. And then you can store those and have those. But here's the first thing that I want you to write down. And this is so true. Satan hates everything God loves. He absolutely hates everything. You see, for five days, Satan watched God form this beautiful earth. He watched God form the fish in the sea. He watched God form the creeping things on the earth. He watched God form the animals. And then on the sixth day, he watched God form the highest of his creation, man and woman. People, people who he created in his image. And I've shared this before. Being created in the image of God is not about characteristics. It is a status. If you are born, you are created in the image of God as a human. It's not about what you do or what you don't do. It's a status that we enjoy. And Satan hated that. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31... God stands back. It says, then God looked over all he had made. And he saw that it was not only good, it was, say it with me, very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. And so we don't know exactly when it was, but at some point, after God was enjoying everything that he had created, Satan moved in and he tempted Adam and Eve, and they succumbed to that temptation, and they were forever marred, and the earth was forever marred and carried the scars of that disobedience, even to this day, and you and I inherit that sinful nature because of their disobedience, and I'm sure Satan was so happy. You see, Satan is God's enemy. And he will hurt you to hurt God. See, God loves you, and because God loves you and I, Satan hates you. And so that's why he goes after us. And we're told that in this world, we will have troubles. We will have trials. Just because you receive Christ in your life doesn't mean you're going to be free from all difficulty. As a matter of fact, let me just be straight up for a minute. When you accept Christ in your life, a lot of times things get worse. <laughs> They get a whole lot worse before they get better. And Satan knows that, and that's why he's gone after that. There's no neutral zone. Darkness and light are at war. Now, I've always wondered, why, why couldn't just Satan go after the creeping things that God created on the earth? Because this is just me. I don't like anything with too many legs or no legs. You know what I'm saying? Just... 
Man, we had a bunch of neighbors over recently, and my next door neighbor was talking about mowing and seeing all the grass snakes. I'm like, grass snakes? I ain't all about that. No, I'll shut the mower off. I'll just let you just go. You can have it for a while. I'll come, I'll come back after you're done. Now, I remember one time I was a little boy. I was walking through this old house with, with some friends, and we, were, we could be there. It was abandoned, but we were with our parents. My, my uncle up in Minnesota was thinking about buying it. And I turned, I walked through this doorway, and this spider web just, I mean, it just went all around my head. I'm like, ah! Because all I could just think was this spider that was big enough to, you know, the whole, this thing was now probably on me. You know, so I'm just, oh, the whole afternoon, I just, <laughs> just awful. I, I get, I get to creeps just thinking about it. You know, the first year we went into ministry, it was like the enemy just wanted to intimidate me at every turn. You're never going to make it. You'll never stand the test of time. I own this place, not God. You know, just all the lies. And I remember I made my coffee, and if you know me, I enjoy my coffee, maybe more than I ought to. But I really enjoy good coffee. And I had my coffee. I was all set. It was one of those things we splurged on. We didn't have a lot of money back then, but we bought good coffee. And remember, I opened up the cupboard, and I grabbed my mug out of there, and I look in there, and there's one of those silverfish inside of my mug. Like, no! Oh, so I, like, I'm taking authority over this thing right now. And I grab some paper towel, and I'm just in there. I'm, I'm, I'm just squishing that thing in my cup. You know, I'm like, you're not, no way. No, you're not going to ruin my day. Throw that away. And so I got, I got my coffee, and I'm just pouring myself a cup. It, it was in a diff, different cup. I didn't use the same one, okay. But not that dumb. <laughs> Like, Michelle, come here and wash this cup for me, please. <laughs> so, anyhow, Satan, Satan hates you and I. And, uh, and that's just the way it's going to be. Just settle that in your heart. Here's the next thing that I want you to write down, and this is very, very important. Sin destroys everything it touches. It, it actually destroys everything it touches. It's like radioactive waste. It defiles anything that it gets around. And it, it's just, it's not a good thing. There's nothing in this world that has not been touched by sin. We live in a fallen world right now. Someday God is going to redeem the earth. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. But right now we're living in this fallen world. And sin is everywhere. It's rampant. And Satan still, he still has authority over all those that have not invited Christ into their lives and just declared his lordship over their lives. And we read that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. John is saying, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Now, this is a difficult concept, but I want you to understand this. Anything holiness touches becomes holy. Any person, anything God gets close to becomes holy. You remember the story in Exodus where Moses was in God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes off the mountain, his face is shining with the holiness of God. And it was, it was so bright, they actually asked him to put a veil over his face. And he took it off anytime he went into the presence of God. So holiness can be transferred, but the same is also true. Anything sin touches gets defiled, gets destroyed. Any, any person that embraces sin and comes in contact with it. It defiles them. You see, you and I have family, friends, co-workers that are under the sway of the wicked one today. And they, they probably don't even realize it. 
And then what happens, and this is sad, but this is a commentary because this is real. I want you to write this down. Society devalues everyone that's different. See, this is how this all starts unfolding here. Society is a mirror into the spiritual realm. It really is. What's happening in society is a reflection of what's happening in the heavenlies. If you could watch a video over Eastern Europe right now, you would see a conflict in the heavenlies happening over the principalities and the powers over that part of the world. And so it's very easy then for society to begin to devalue people. See, culture is very angry and divided right now. Culture is polarized because of these things. And Satan wants you to believe that the person that doesn't look just like you, the person from a different neighborhood, the person that holds a different view from the view that you hold, is less than you, is not deserving of your friendship or your fellowship. You see, Satan wants to devalue others based on differences. But the kingdom of God builds up and brings value to people because of our differences. You see, God loves the diversity. He loves that in his kingdom. People from every culture, every part of the world coming together, even in a place like this, look around you. God loves this. This is the kingdom of God. People who look different, sound different, are different, dress different. Thank God for all the variety that we have. Man, I don't want to eat just one kind of food all the time. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to listen to just one kind of music. God loves all the diversity. He loves the cultures. And that's why we celebrate it here. You see, no matter what society is doing out there, the way we fight that isn't by using the same weapons. Listen, Paul tells us the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so you've got to look at people differently. We don't use their weapons, we just get along. You know what I'm saying? We love our brothers and sisters. And we love all those that aren't here yet. And we value, I value, the diversity God has given. And I never take it for granted. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Again, Paul sells, says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't fight. Don't fight the way they fight. Don't swing at every pitch in the dirt. But let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. By giving you a kingdom perspective. And that comes from the word of God. It comes from worshiping together. It comes from fellowshipping together in life groups. It comes from being together. And as lively stones, we're called, we rub against one another. And as we do that, something wonderful happens. We become conformed to the image of Christ who loves all people. That's the kingdom of God. That's how Satan, well, that's why Satan's fighting so hard because he doesn't like this. And so we appreciate this. See, he doesn't, he doesn't want to see relationships developed. He wants to keep us divided he wants to keep us against each other. But the kingdom of God is all about relationships. You cannot do Christianity by yourself. You can't do it alone. You know, you may be able to receive Christ on your own. I was all alone in my parents' living room by myself, praying, asking God to come into my life. And, but even that, somebody was praying for me. I didn't see him. I don't know who they were, but somebody was praying 
But once you receive Christ, everything else of significance happens because of other people. That's why we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, we read, two people are better off than one. And if you're single today, or single again, you may want to claim this verse. Underline it, God, I want, I'm looking for that Mr. Right. I'm looking for that Mrs. Right. Can I give you a little advice? Start being the kind of person you would want to marry. Come on, the Holy Ghost is all about that. Start becoming the person that you would like to marry, and then God will bring that other person who's doing the same thing. And then you know how that goes. It's like magnets that attract. You just walk in, it's like. I mean, you know how it is. Those hormones, they all start bubbling up in there, and yeah. I'll be honest, the first time I met Michelle, I, did not, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I was, I was moving across the United States, and then from there I was moving across the other side of the world. I, I, I didn't have it. She was a very sweet, beautiful young lady, but I was like, see ya. <laughs> my, my motto, and she'll tell you this, it was bachelor to the rapture. <laughs> to live for him without her. That was, that was where I was at it. <laughs> but something happened, and God just caused me to just notice. And it was, then it was like, <laughs> I mean, you know, and it was wonderful. And then love and marriage, you know, how that all works. <laughs> so I digress. So, if you, so claim that part of the verse. All right, moving on. It says, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. And again, that's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why worshiping together is important. Because God sets the solitary in families. He brings us together that way. And so the enemy wants us to isolate I would say this, God doesn't want us to isolate, he wants you to insulate. Insulate yourself from the world and then go out there. Get involved, get in the middle of everything and serve people and love people and let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works. Thanks again, Dave. <laughs> that they may glorify your Father in heaven. That's what God really wants here. So I want to help us very quickly. We're going to finish up, we're going to look at three things uh, to help us see the lost the way Jesus sees them. And the very first thing I want you to write down is this. The lost are valued by Jesus. He places a very high value on them. God loves the entire world, but He sees us as individuals. I remember when I received Christ, it dawned on me that John 3.16 made sense now. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the whole world, but He saw me. He saw my need. He saw that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And so we've just got to, we've just got to value what God values. In Psalm 139, verse 16, we read this. And this is the psalmist reflecting on God. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. What a wonderful thought to know God loves us that way. And He not only loves you, He loves the person you sit next to at the office. He loves the person you sit next to on the school bus. He loves the person that you work together on the line with. He loves all of them as individuals. And He loves the person that you're sitting next to right now the same way He loves you 
And all you couples are like, you hear that? This guy, <laughs> all the wives are like. <laughs> but he really does. He values each and every one of us. And so this is a change that we have to make. I want to give you some application. Write this down. We must surrender our attitudes to God. We've got to surrender them. Surrender the good attitudes and the bad attitudes as well. See, let's let God transform us from the inside out by changing the way we think about others. Because it starts with us. You know, when Jesus was, was walking on this earth, people were attracted to him. They liked being around him. They liked coming to his church services, if I can put it that way. We read about it in Luke chapter 15, in verse 1. It's, it's really interesting. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. We, any, we got any notorious sinners? No, I don't, don't raise your hands. <laughs> they often came to listen to Jesus teach. They liked, they liked being in his services. And guess who that made mad? The Pharisees. The people that were supposed to be the walking examples of how to please God. It says, this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And so Jesus tells them this story. So he's talking to a big crowd, and there's Pharisees in there that are grumbling and complaining because there's sinners and there's, there's prostitutes and there's all sorts of pe people around. And everybody in between all that. He realizes if they're going to understand the heart of the Father, they're really going to have to know. And so I'm going to paint a picture for them. Because we all think in stories. And so he tells them this story. He goes on to say, Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Now, let me give you a little background into the, the culture this wasn't just, you know, like, oh, I've got $10 and I lost a buck. When you got married, your husband's family gave you an heirloom necklace from the family of 10 coins. And so this was an heirloom piece of jewelry. And all the ladies are like, oh. Because she lost one of the coins. And losing any part of that necklace was considered a social faux pas. It was, it was a disgrace. And she was devastated. It's like if your husband's family gave you a beautiful ring, say it had three big stones in it, and then one of the stones fell out, and all you got are those prongs, you know. I mean, it's, it's glaring, right? And so she's, she's just panicking. I mean, she, she, won't she light a lamp? And search the entire house and search carefully until she's find it. And so she's like looking everywhere behind, you know, all the plants and everything. She's going through all the couch cushions like, oh, that's the remote to the TV. I was wondering where that was. And she's going and she's looking underneath a sock. Aha, a sock. By the way, it's going to be summer soon. Don't, don't wear socks with sandals. Can I, just, can I just say that? So she's looking around. She's oh, she's like this. She says, oh, I found it. She's so excited. She calls her friends. She calls the neighbors over. And she has a party, and, and people are like this. You mean that's, that's how God sees the lost person? He's going to go to all that trouble like that woman would? And Jesus is saying yes. That's how important people are to him. That's how, how important you are to him. And for those of you watching, that's how important you are in His sight. He cares about you and he, he loves you. So we've got to change our attitudes and kind of reconfigure. It's the value of one. We can't see crowds any longer. We've got to see the one the way Jesus sees them. You see, Jesus invited people personally to follow Him. And there's nothing more powerful than a personal invitation to help somebody find Christ. You know, Easter Sunday is next Sunday. It's next week. And we live in a very traditional area. We all know that. For a lot of people, if they're going to go to church, it's going to be one of two days. Same with me. It's going to be Easter. And what's the other one? 
right. So I'm encouraging you, invite your friends and family. 84% of people that are invited will come. And especially if you don't just invite them, bring them, like I said. Just bring them. Encourage them. Say, hey, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you at the door. I'll have a cup of coffee waiting for you. Or I'll take you out to eat afterwards. Whatever it is, compel them to come so that they can come into the presence of God and so that they can hear a message that can open a door into heaven for them that they never even knew was there. I grew up in church and I never heard the gospel. And so we're encouraging you to bring them along with you. Here's the second thing that I want you to write down. The lost reminds us of God's grace. The grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, we read this. Don't forget that you Gentiles, these were people who were outside the family of God, you Gentiles used to be outsiders. In those days you were living apart from Christ, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. So he's saying, don't forget, once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. It's so easy to forget on this side of the cross what it was like to go into a church as a lost person for the first time. You know, it's like, is there anybody in there that I know? You know, or you're sitting out in the parking lot and you're literally in a cold sweat, thinking, having an anxiety panic attack about going in there because you don't know what God's like. My sister, my oldest sister, she said, I'm afraid to go to church. I said, why, Maureen? She said, I'm afraid that if I walk through the door of that church, lightning is going to strike me. (laughs) And she was serious. I said, Maureen, I said, I will walk you in the door. God's not going to strike you with lightning. But there's this anxiety. People don't know. They're, They're afraid. We forget what that was like. And so we have to, again, change our thinking, put ourselves in their shoes That's why we want to make it easy for people to come into a place like this. People have asked me, Mike, is this a seeker-sensitive church? And I say no, because that whole system failed miserably. It never discipled anybody. But I will say this, we are a user-friendly church. You come just as you are. You're welcome to come here. Sit as many weeks as you want. Just kick the tires. Ask questions. We'll help you. We'll do the best that we can. And so I want you to write this down. This is why we must surrender, because of the grace of God, we must surrender our abilities to God. This is all part of being a living sacrifice. See, God's grace you with gifts and abilities. 87% of the body of Christ has no idea what God-given gifts that each of you have. People don't know. And that's not the people's fault. That's the pastor's fault. Because he didn't provide anything for them to discover that. Well, guess what? Today, starting point, we do this every month on the second Sunday, Discovery 2.0. We're going to meet right over in this section or this one here, one of these two. And we're going to help you discover what your gifts and your abilities are so that you can begin to flow in them. You can begin to serve in them. Meet other people who are gifted the way you are, who enjoy doing the same things that you enjoy doing. And then eventually get you on the dream team. Because God wants you to do this. He wants you to know Him. To know God. Then He wants us to find freedom in life. Tear the rear view mirrors off the plow and just keep going forward. Forget about all the drama that happened to you yesterday. I'm going forward with Christ today. He wants you to find freedom, and that happens in the context of relationships. And then he wants us to discover our purpose. And we do that every, every week here so that you can jump on. You don't have to just, just jump in today. You can jump in at any time. And then once we discover our purpose, he wants us to make a difference with how God has created us. And when we do that, that's when real fulfillment comes. Because he's not only building you and I up, he's building the church out. 
This is his program, global, global domination. Take, take the whole thing over, okay? But it starts here. It starts where we are and where we live. And see, so we see Proverbs chapter 12 says this, The righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. We have to be a guide to our neighbors. You know, we're still on God's dream team even outside of these walls. Can you say amen? We're on God's dream team wherever we are. We can only be salt and light, not only in here, but wherever there's tastelessness, blandness, and darkness. And your unsaved friends and family may not call it that, but that's exactly what it feels like. That's what life is like. And so Christ wants us to be more than that. Having a heart to serve not only counts here and at home, but it counts wherever you and I are. You know, I wanted to give you an update. You know, Pastor Keith was in Ukraine. We've now sent three other teams to Ukraine. And we are working with local churches there. And we released $100,000 as a network We are shipping food over there, buying it by the truckload right now and distributing it and distributing clothing and the things that people need. The churches, just like ours, right now, over $116,000 on top of that $100,000 to help those war refugees. And there's five churches, four in particular and hopefully one more. I'll read them to you. In Cernauti, Terranople, Kiev, Maripol, and hopefully Nikolaev. We're working with churches there that are housing, clothing, and feeding refugees. And so if you get on our website, right on the front page, it'll take you to the network of related pastors. You can give directly to that. Every dollar that you and I give goes to that. There's no overhead. There's no administration, nothing. It is going to buy supplies to feed people, clothe them, and share the gospel with them through the local church. Can you say amen? See, we're making a difference in a lot of different places. Here's the third thing that I want you to write down. It's this. The lost are included in God's plan for society. The lost are included. See, God has a plan to reach every level and area and sphere of influence in our culture. We preached a message here a few months ago about the seven areas of influence and one or two of these are going to resonate with you that you may feel called to be salt and light in. Those areas are business and education and government and thankfully our village president as a believer is in there as salt and light making an influence there. Maybe that's an area that stirs you up as well. But then there's the area of family and there's arts and entertainment, and I would even put sports in there, and maybe that's your area of influence. You can be Christ-like in that sphere of influence and win others. And then the media, newscasting and movies and Hollywood, basically, that God wants believers permeating every area of culture so that we can be an influence for the body and let God know that Listen, he loves people. And as we walk closer and closer with him, more and more people are going to be attracted to him. And so we read in 1 Peter 2, verse 12. Be careful. And that's the first thing he says. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, Even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. (laughs) We're to be careful. Here's why. You see, we can only make a difference if we are different. You know what I'm saying? If we walk away from, from that colorful story or that gossip, around the water cooler, or we just excuse ourselves and just say, you know, I can't be a part of that. Not in a condemning way, but just as I need to be different. 
And so as living sacrifices, we've got to surrender our attitudes to God. We've got to surrender our abilities to God. And here's the last thing that I want you to write down. You must surrender your allegiance to God. Got to surrender your allegiance to Him. Need to say yes to Him. I want to very quickly finish up with this story. I, as a young person, seven, eight, nine years old, I was trying to find God. I was trying to find him anywhere I could, and I had quit going to our denominational church because I concluded I could not find him there. That was wrong thinking, but that's what my stupid eight-year-old mind came up with. <laughs> but God didn't forget about me. And right across the street from our house, there was this little home missions church, and that dear little pastor and his wife, they decided with some college students from a college out in Minnesota that were traveling through to have a VBS. And they invited all the neighborhood kids. And I, I said, yes, I want to do this. And so every day I showed up, I memorized the scriptures, I did all the projects, and then the VBS was over, and I didn't hear anything ever again from them. Fast forward, I was 13 years old. And I heard the gospel. I heard the message that Christ loved me and that he died on the cross for me. And that I could turn from being under the wrath of God and the judgment of God to being headed towards heaven and being forgiven and having peace. So I gave my life to Christ and the ministry that I prayed with said, you have to find a local church. So I went to that little church again because there was a new pastor there. And right away, the first week, he started discipling me, started inviting me over to his house for meals. And then I said, you know, I came to this church once before, and he said, I've never seen you. He said, I said it was before you were the pastor. He said there was a little VBS they had. And he goes, well, let's go look in the records. And he went through all the index cards, and he goes, oh, here it is, Mike Free. And when he showed me the card, he, he looked, and written in red across that card, it said, not a prospect. And he said, I'm so sorry. That may be the way you feel here today, or you watching. But you don't feel you can be good enough to be in a church, or other people have told you you'll never amount to anything. I'm telling you, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And he will never leave you or forsake you. But it starts with giving your allegiance and your loyalty to the one who created you and the one who loved you. I'd like us all just to bow our heads right now. There's no moving around. If you're at home or wherever you're watching this, just bow your head right now. Maybe you need to say yes to God today. Or maybe you need to say yes to God again. That's all right. God wants to just embrace you and bring you back. Maybe you feel far away from him today. And you just know. And you feel that tug in your heart. That's the Holy Spirit calling you home, calling you back to God, or calling you to God for the very first time. In about a minute, I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. It's just to help you give words to what you're feeling in your heart. And here's God's promise. When you say yes to him, he will come into your life and he will forgive you just like he did me and countless others. So here today, if, if you would say, Mike, just I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward, but 
I, I just want you to signify, if, if you'd say, Mike, count me in, include me in on that prayer, I want you to just lift up your hand so that I can see it right now. Just lift up your hand. Yes, God bless you. Yes, all the way on the back row, I see your hand. God bless you. Yes, young lady, good job. Are there others? You would say yes to God, yes. Are there others here? Just need to get back to God. Yes, God bless you. Good job. I want us just to all pray this together. And I want you to mean this from your heart. God will hear you. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you today on this Palm Sunday that you sent Jesus to be my King. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean and draw me to yourself. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you rose again. You're alive today. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And I choose to follow you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. And amen. Come on, just encourage those that just prayed that prayer. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Now, for those of you that, that raised your hands right after service, I'm going to ask you to go over see, and see Pastor Larry. And with Pastor Larry is Dolanda Prasuda. She is the Associate Director of Life Groups. They're going to help you uh, get connected to the Lord. We've got some materials for you. I wrote a little booklet. It's going to help you. It's all free. You can take it and start your new life in Christ or start your new walk in Christ. Hey, let's just give them one more. Good job.